Welcome to Tokyo Wave, recorded in a live studio in Harajuku, Japan, with your hosts, Aaron and Parker. All right, everyone, welcome to episode 59 of Tokyo Wave. We are your hosts, Aaron Randall and Parker Allen. Today, we are joined by a special guest, Dr. Fabrizio Bozato, international relations specialist, ocean policy researcher, and geopolitics commentator. On Tokyo Wave, we bring you weekly updates from our studio in Harajuku. Join us in segments featuring this week's top news, political happenings, business, and other random stuff. To get us started, here are this week's top news highlights. Japan extends COVID 19 state of emergency to June 20th. Former Prime Minister Abe cites four senior lawmakers as possible candidates to succeed Suga. British national to be prosecuted for stuffing bentos into mailboxes in Kamakura. This week in Japan. All right, so here's our top news item for this week. Japan extends COVID 19 state of emergency to June 20th. Kyoto News has reported that on May 28th, the Japanese government extended the COVID 19 state of emergency covering Tokyo, Osaka, and seven other prefectures by three weeks to June 20th, just over a month before the Olympics are set to begin. This means that the tough restrictions on restaurants will continue, including the current ban on serving alcohol and the requirement to close by 8 o'clock p.m., as well as a cap on attendance at sports events and concerts that will stay in effect in Tokyo, Osaka, Hokkaido, Aichi, Kyoto, Hyogo, Okayama, Hiroshima, and Fukuoka prefectures. In other words, no fun for another month and 20 days? Yep. <laughs> Okinawa, the 10th and most recent addition to the state of emergency, is already under the measure until June 20th. Prime Minister Yoshihide Suga told reporters on May 27th after consulting with members of his cabinet, including Health Minister Norihisa Tamura and Coronavirus Response Minister Yasutoshi Nishimura, that infections are declining in some of the areas, but On the whole, the situation is highly unpredictable. Nishimura told an expert panel it is necessary to bring infections down to a quote, manageable level so that we don't see a large rebound down the road, noting governors can impose tougher restrictions than the government's guidelines if they deem them necessary. This comes as prefectural leaders have been urging the government to extend the emergency, with Tokyo's governor Yuriko Koike calling for an additional month. Infections in the capital, where tens of thousands of athletes, officials, and journalists are slated to visit for the Olympics, due to start on July 23rd, have been slow to decline despite Koike. Taking the extra step of asking department stores and movie theaters to remain closed. Well, where are we going with this? So, June 20th, how many months is that from the official start of the Olympics? Less than a month, because it's supposed to start on July the 23rd. So, we got another lockdown, less than 5% inoculated in Japan, and we have the Olympics coming up. Well, we're up to 10,000 vaccinations now. <laughs> 10,000, really? Yeah. That's and- the total. More than 500,000 additional added per day. So, if the level of vaccinations continues to ramp up to a million a day, which is what the Prime Minister has been eyeing as the target, then we'll see better vaccination levels happening over the next several months. But, of course, what percentage will we be at on July 23rd?、Um, probably less than 50. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, here's for staying hopeful, right? Up next, former Prime Minister Abe cites four senior lawmakers as possible candidates to succeed Suga. Gigi Press has reported that former Prime Minister Shinzo Abe has cited four senior lawmakers as candidates to succeed current Prime Minister and Liberal Democratic Party President Yoshihide Suga in the future. The four named by Abe in an interview with monthly magazine Gekkan Hanada. Are Foreign Minister Toshimitsu Motegi, Chief Cabinet Secretary Katsunobu Kato, former Education Minister Hakubun Shimomura, 
and former LDP policy panel chairman Fumio Kishida. In the interview, Abe reiterated his support for Suga's re-election as LDP president in a poll to be held in line with the expiration of his current term as leader of the party at the end of September. Abe said that the Suga administration has been making appropriate decisions regarding the fight against the novel coronavirus, rebutting criticism that the government has been slow in responding to the pandemic. When the upcoming LDP presidential election is held, only about a year would have passed since Suga took office. Noting that there are both good and bad times, Abe said that, quote, we all should work strenuously together to support the Suga administration. Abe dismissed rumors that he will seek a third tenure as prime minister, saying, quote, I'm not considering it at all because there are many talented people in the party. Interesting. I think uh, that should be a breath of fresh air for Prime Minister Suga because a lot of people were seeing Abe's recent return to the political spotlight as a potential sign that he might be looking to re-snag the Prime Minister's spot. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, the rumors about his health and everything are true. It's just he's not in the best uh, condition to take it back. Yeah, and I also think that his support of Suga is important because obviously there's a lot of horse trading going on in the LDP right now and for a senior statesman like Abe to show support for keeping Suga as prime minister uh, beyond September which is when his term expires that's huge all right up next British national to be prosecuted for stuffing bentos into mailboxes in Kamakura the Daily Yomi Uri has reported that Kanagawa Prefectural Police have decided to prosecute a male British national who is accused of dumping trash into mailboxes in Kamakura City. At around 2.20 p.m. on March 16th, Anthony Tanaka, of no known occupation, allegedly stuffed an empty bento, or boxed meal, container chopsticks and a plastic bottle into a street mailbox in front of the city's government office. Maybe he was just working at Uber Eats. <laughs> yeah. Don't think that was a good idea. Yeah, yeah. Upon his arrest on suspicion of violating the Waste Management and Public Cleansing Act, that's a law, Tanaka, 37 years old, denied the allegations. The suspect told the Kamakura police station, Oh, I thought it was a garbage can. The matter emerged last December when the Kamakura Post Office telephoned police to report mail stained by garbage. Through March 17th, police confirmed that a total of 150 pieces of mail had been soiled in seven separate incidents. Of those incidents, three took place at the mailbox in front of the city office. On March 16th, an officer on patrol apprehended Tanaka after seeing him insert the bento box into the slot. <laughs> that must have been an awkward situation, trying to cram the bento in there. And, Sir, uh, what are you doing? Or maybe it was a stakeout. Yeah, 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 maybe. <laughs> they had like 30 <laughs> police officers, you know, waiting in the shadows around the mailbox for this uh, hapless Tanaka to do the deed. Dude sounds insane, yeah. <laughs> so police have been investigating whether Tanaka was also behind the first seven incidents as well. I wonder if they got prints. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, similar to the States, right, uh, messing with mailbox is a federal crime in the United States. Um, it's also something you don't want to mess with, I guess, here in uh, Japan and Kamakura as well. Yes, especially not in Kamakura, apparently. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, and I was, uh, there was a bit of a Twitter conversation about this as well. And I think, uh, you know, of the lame excuses in the world of lame excuses, I don't know if there's a, an an award or some sort of, you know, decoration that we can give to Mr. Tanaka for this excuse. But he said it, he thought it was a trash box, right? Mm, 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 mm. A trash box. Yeah. That yeah. has a small slot and has the big, you know, Japan Post logo on it. And it's red. <laughs> Seriously? I love that his name is Tanaka as well. You know, like <laughs> the most generic. 
I wonder if he really doesn't have a job or he just refrained from giving his employer's information because, I mean, who wants that to get back to their job? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> Putting yeah. bentos in mailboxes. Dude just lost it, man. Ouch. Up next, we have a special interview with Dr. Fabrizio Bozato, international relations specialist, ocean policy researcher, and geopolitics commentator. You're now listening to Tokyo Wave. Dr. Fabrizio Bozato is an international relations specialist focused on maritime affairs in the Indo-Pacific region. Dr. Bozato holds a PhD in political science from the Tom Kang University Graduate Institute of International Affairs and Strategic Studies in Taiwan, a master's in international relations from University of Tasmania in Australia, and a master's in political science from the University of Milan in Italy. Dr. Bozato's areas of research include the blue economy, science diplomacy, and relations between the Holy See and China. He is frequently asked to comment for international media on issues of geopolitics and diplomacy. Dr. Bozato serves as a non-resident ambassador of the Sovereign Order of Malta to the Republic of Nauru. In 2020, Dr. Bozato received the knighthood of the Order of the Star of Italy from the President of the Republic of Italy. He also serves as a senior research fellow at the Sasakawa Peace Foundation's Ocean Policy Research Institute. Dr. Bozato, thank you so much for coming on Tokyo Wave today. Gentlemen, good afternoon. Thank you for having me here with you today. It's a pleasure and honor. Yes, thank you so much. So, reading through your background, it was our first time to hear about the Order of Malta, which I believe is a separate entity from the country Malta. Could you tell us more about the Order of Malta and how you came to become an ambassador to the Republic of Nauru? All right. Uh, please allow me to start with the complete official name of the Order. It is the Sovereign Military Hospitaller Order of St. John of Jerusalem, of Rhodes, and of Malta. And this very long name uh, reflects the 9th century, almost one millennia old history of the order and the mission of the order. It is sovereign because the order is a sovereign entity, not a state, but an entity that enjoys international public law personality. The other case being the Holy See, which is often confused or conflated with the Vatican City State. Actually, the Holy See is the supreme government of the Catholic Church. And uh, while the Vatican is a very young microstate, established in 1929, thanks to a treaty uh, between the then Kingdom of Italy and uh, the Holy See, to uh, offer some territorial guarantee to the Pope. But we should keep in mind that between the end of the Papal States in 1870 and the establishment of the Vatican City State in 1929, the Holy See continued to be um, a full member of the international system. The Order of Malta became sovereign in 1113, thanks to a papal bull, a papal decree, establishing the order as a sovereign. And since then, uh, it, it has been playing and seldom acknowledged but very significant part in European and world history. The order as a sovereign entity entertains diplomatic relations with 110 states, plus the European Union and the Palestinian Authority. And just like the Holy See, it is at the United Nations as a permanent observer. It has permanent observer status. So if you go to New York or Geneva, you, will, you can visit the permanent mission of the order to the UN and its agencies. Well, then it is military because for the Catholic Church, it is a military order. Actually, it is a lay Catholic order, even though a few members of the order are religious. It is an hospitaler order, 
uh, because the mission of the order is to provide, uh, to assist the poor, the sick, the needy. Actually, the motto of the order in Latin is Tuitio Fidei and Obsequium Pauperum, that means preservation, protection of the faith, the Catholic faith, of course, but also Obsequium, which means more than assistance, reverence for the poor, the sick, and the needy. Order, because it's, it's a Catholic order, start with as a, as a, start as a monastic community, actually. Of St. John, St. John is the uh, pattern of the order. Actually, we, call, we can say the national day of the order is June 23rd, the day in which the Catholic Church remembers and celebrates St. John, St. John the Baptist. Of Jerusalem, because the order start in Jerusalem, in the 11th century, when a group of well-intended people form a monastic community in Jerusalem and establish an hospital with the permission of the Sultan of Egypt, at the time it was the sovereign of that, of that of Jerusalem and, and, and the, 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 the Levant. So we are talking pre-Crusade time. Uh, then, in, uh, as I said, in 1113, the order became sovereign and uh, also was it was tasked with uh, the protection of the pilgrims to the holy land and also to with providing medical assistance to them uh, i want to to emphasize that since the very beginning the order has uh, been providing assistance help uh, care to and for everybody uh, in a non-discriminatory fashion. So even in Jerusalem, the order was helping the Christian population, but also the, the Jewish and the Muslim communities. For instance, uh, at the hospital of the order, the, the Jewish patients were uh, given kosher food. Uh, the order also starts some innovations in what was their medical care. So one bed for each patient, seems uh, quite natural today, but at the time it was quite an element of novelty. A separate word for uh, expecting ladies, mothers, and, 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 and newborn kids. But, you know, he also had to militarize and uh, became a fighting force, uh, at least in part. The numbers of the, so of the, of the fighting brethren was never very high if compared to that of the, of the other Catholic orders that were established as warriors, if you like, like the uh, Templar Knights, uh, the Deutonic Knights, but they fought bravely in what is called the Holy Land. I use the, the expression Holy Land not out of uh, religious conviction, but because it's geographically, historical, more accurate. I could say Levant, but that will be debatable. So the order uh, in, in the Holy Land also controls some fortresses, territories. Uh, maybe you heard of the famous crack of the Chevaliers in, in Syria. There was a, an order of Malta, uh, the order of St. John at the time, fortress. Then uh, when uh, the, um, the Christian kingdoms in the um, Holy Land fell, uh, with, uh, with, uh, with, uh, when the, the, the Muslim forces were able to re recapture even the last stronghold, St. John of Acres, uh, the order had to move to find another headquarter. So it moved initially to Cyprus and then to Rhodes. And in Rhodes, it established itself as a um, naval force fighting against the Ottomans, the rising Ottoman power, but also as, as the sovereign of that, of that, um, of the Thailand. Uh, you, if you visit Rhodes, you can, you can visit the, the palace of the Grand Master, the leader of the order, if you want to use this term leader, is called the Grand Master. The order attracts new recruits from all over Europe, uh, including many shows of, of European aristocratic families, and subdivided in language groups. And, uh, well, it was able to, to stay in Rhodes for a few centuries, but eventually, in uh, at the onset of the 16th century, uh, Solomon the Magnificent uh, was able to uh, evict the knights from Cyprus. They offer a, a, a very valiant resistance, 
to the extent that Solomon the Magnificent accorded the honor of the arms to, to the knights who were able to leave the islands with their equipment, uh, weapons, uh, flags, everything. And then the, the Holy Roman Emperor, Charles V, offered a new um, home to the order, the island of Malta. At the time, it was quite a barren place, unfortified with water supply problems, but, but the order decided to, to give it a go. And uh, they, they were never real sovereign of the island. By all means, in the fact, they were the people ruling the, the Malta, but symbolically, they had to pay a rent of one Maltese falcon per year to the Holy Roman Emperor. They, they, the, the order for, was able to fortify Malta and uh, the other two islands of the archipelago in order to withstand the Ottoman assault. And also they continue their um, work as, as a naval power and fighters. Uh, they were so brilliant in doing that, that they soon became an unsufferable thorn in the flank of the, of the Ottoman Empire. And so the Ottomans were bent on, on, on extirpating that Christian stronghold in the, at the center of the Mediterranean. And in, 18, in sorry, 1565, they launched an attack en masse against, first against uh, the island of Gozo, where they, they order the order uh, the fortress and where 5,000 people live. The head of the garrison decided to surrender and the Ottomans just enslaved or killed the whole population. So. Uh, for the knights on the main island, it became clear that the alternative was to resist or die, not surrender. The Grand Master at that time was, uh, called La, was a, uh, the family name of the Grand Master was De La Vallette. And this is why the capital city of the Republic of Malta is called Valletta. The city was named after him. After a few months, the, a few weeks actually, the Ottomans gave up. And uh, so it was the first of a series of Christian victory that represented, you know, can be seen as represented the pushback uh, against the Ottoman Empire. So the Great Siege of Malta in 1565, then we had the Naval Battle of Lepanto uh, in 1571, and then the, the Siege of Vienna, uh, where, uh, you know, a little bit later, and that the siege of Vienna marked the, the, the turning point in the military equilibria between the, the Ottoman Empire and, and the, the, the Christian kingdoms of Europe. So after the great victory, the order received donations and uh, became quite prominent in Europe to the point that they also start to um, not only to fortify Malta, but also make it beautiful. So if you visit Malta today, you'll, you, you, I recommend to, to go and visit the Magistral Palace and the Cathedral of St. John. And there are many, many nice features and places to, to, to see there. And they all uh, remind the visitors of uh, the, the fact that the history of Malta is closely connected, at least for a few centuries, with, with, with the history of the order. Then, uh, in 1798, after a, mm, the, well, basically a couple of centuries uh, during which uh, the order kept fighting the, the Ottoman forces and in particular the Barbary pirates from North Africa, the French, uh, well, Napoleon Bonaparte, were able to capture Malta and evict the order. And uh, from that time, the order was homeless. Uh, but one European sovereign, not a Catholic one though, came to the rescue. Tsar Paul I of Russia uh, welcomed the order in St. Petersburg and uh, is also in the list of the Grand Masters of the order as a de facto Grand Master, being the Tsar, uh, a Christian Orthodox, not a Catholic, the Pope couldn't recognize him as a Grand Master. So the order stayed in uh, St. Petersburg in Russia for a short while. Uh, they had, uh, Tsar Paul I even created a, a special corps of bodyguards, staffed with uh, um, knights of the order. 
and uh, some uh, called the Ice Knights, and some Knights of the Order even took part in the first Russia Antarctic uh, discovery expedition. They were crewmen in in the in the fleet led by Admiral Gottlieb. They stopped in London to meet Joseph Banks, who had been on Captain Cook's endeavor, got some intelligence, some information, and then actually arrived to Antarctica, to the part of Antarctica that for the Antarctic Treaty is still unclaimed territory. So uh, there's also an element of mystery, but uh, the historical record does not substantiate it yet. Then, uh, since 1834, the order has been in Rome, and uh, so... Uh, is still the case, uh, the order ceased to exert territorial sovereignty in 1798, but it is not deprived of uh, a geographical dimension, since in Rome, mm, there are, uh, the, the order has its seat of government in two compounds within the city of Rome. One is in Via Condotti, the Magistral Palace, and the other one is the uh, residence of the Grand Master, atop one of the seven hills of Rome. If you go there, I recommend to pay particular attention to the main gate. There's a keyhole, and if you peep through the keyhole of the main gate, you can see three countries, Italy, well, the Order of Malta, and the Vatican City. You have a nice view of St. Peter's Basilica. As I said before, now the Order is continuing its humanitarian work, counting of about uh, 13,000 members, 20,000, well, you know, employees all over the world in the order's clinics and medical facilities, and uh, 80,000 volunteers in all continents. Uh, plus, it also has specialized agencies uh, like Maltas and International, based in Germany, in Köln, but it, in Matters International, it is uh, the oldest rapid deployment core. For instance, when the, the big tsunami happened in Indonesia in, in, in 2004, Matters International was able to, to intervene and offer disaster relief to the population. Uh, it's also, the order is also active uh, in, um, uh, in rescuing the migrants in the Mediterranean, even though... Uh, this is something I want to, to um, highlight. The order does it on the Italian um, Coast Guard and Navy units. Uh, so we, we don't behave of, uh, uh, th we don't have the same conduct of NGOs, other NGOs that have their own ships. We, for us, the human life is a supreme value. And so we provide help, assistance, and save lives, because we believe in 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 in, in that. We do, we are. And this is the mantra of the order and its diplomatic service. We are impartial, neutral, apolitical. Uh, we what our humanitarian work is um, our way to fulfill our regional mission to issue fide, so giving Christian witness and uh, obsequium pauperum, helping the poor and the needy wherever they, uh, it occurs. Uh, then also the diplomatic service of the order uh, exists to support the humanitarian effort of the order. So we, we can directly interface with governments when the need arises and uh, being a member of the international system and a venerable one, we also have a wealth of contacts and connections that we use for uh, uh, the sake of uh, peace and humanitarianism. Wow. So many things that I don't think uh, we would ever hear from anybody else in Japan. <laughs> <laughs> no, for sure. For sure. This, this is so... Um, uh interesting such a rich and you know uh wide history of the order um so as i understand it you know it had a stint in saint petersburg russia um but currently it is considered stateless let's say we we are the order is not a state it is a sovereign entity right right by me uh, it, it all it has 
all the sovereign prerogatives of a state. Uh, you know, we issue stamps. We have a postal service. Ah. We have registration plates. Uh, we mint our our coins, so we have uh, our nominally our currency. Uh, we issue passports. Uh, actually, uh, the passport of the order is the rarest passport in the world. There are just 500 of them, huh. uh, about 500. Uh, most of them are diplomatic passports like mine, but there are also some passports of service for the, uh, you know, the, the, the top figures in the order, like the Grand Chancellor as a, as a passport of service or the Grand Master as a passport of service. Do you get asked any uh, strange questions at the airport if you use this passport while traveling? Well, I first of all, we are very cautious with using it because uh, you know, some on a weekly basis get emails or LinkedIn messages from people who believe that they can apply for the diplomatic service of the order and will very much like to to have a diplomatic passport, a Vienna Convention passport for, for, you know, for all, for a set of wrong reasons. Actually, we use our diplomatic passports only when we are strictly in our own service. Otherwise, we use other, uh, our national passports. And so if I have to come to Japan or I have to go to, to, to Thailand or Australia, I use my, my Italian passport. If I have to visit Nauru, back to Nauru, then I will use my passport to the order, the diplomatic passport to the order, or if I have to go to a diplomatic conference or to the United Nations in Geneva, New York, yes, then I will use my, my diplomatic passport. But, you know, we, we are very careful not to give even the impression that we're using the passport for our personal purposes. Fascinating. Well, your history with the Order of Malta, I think, started uh, with your work in the Indo-Pacific and the research that you did about um, the geopolitics around the South Pacific. Could you give us uh, the background on how you came to become an ambassador of the Order of Malta to the Republic of Nauru? Well, uh, before moving to Japan, I've been living in Japan in Taiwan for a few years. In Taiwan, I got to meet some European members of the order, serving the diplomatic ser um, service of the, of the order. And uh, they asked me if I could offer any help with expanding the diplomatic network of the order in the Pacific Islands region. Thanks to my to the time I spent in Fiji, uh, lecturing at the University of Fiji, University of the South Pacific, I thought that uh, I could activate some connections of mine. And uh, I did it successfully with Nauru, took quite almost two years to get to the establishment of uh, diplomatic relations between the sovereign order of Malta and the Republic of Nauru. And uh, after that I did that, I was asked to, if, if I were willing to serve the order in the capacity of uh, ambassador uh, extraordinary plenipotentiary to the Republic of Nauru. I was honored to accept. And in, on July 17th, 2019, I presented my credentials to the then president of Nauru, His Excellency uh, Baron Wanga. And I also had the privilege on that occasion to fly Nauru Airlines on one of the very comfortable 737s and uh, spend some days in, in that beautiful island. Unfortunately, because of the outbreak of uh, the COVID-19 pandemic, I wasn't able to visit in 2020. And I hope that in, and even this year, so I hope that in 2022, uh, there will be a chance for me to to visit back Nauru. Uh, in the meantime, I can conduct my diplomatic activities even from from Taiwan or Japan. And then, you know, another aspect of being a diplomat of the order is that you doesn't matter where you are. You are a official interface between your government and uh, other governments. 
And so that leads me to our next question. So you've been in and out of Japan for several years now.、Uh, what brought you to Japan, where you're currently living now? I was offered a unique opp- opportunity. Well, at the beginning of 2020, I came to Japan to serve as a speaker at an academic event organized and hosted by the Sasakawa Peace Foundation. The event was about security in the Pacific Islands region, and、uh, back then I was offered to start serving at the Sasakawa Peace Foundation as a senior research fellow at the at their Ocean Policy Research Institute. I enthusiastically accept.、Uh, had to wait for a few months in Taiwan, but eventually, in late October two thousand twenty. Uh, because in those weeks it was possible to come to Japan, if, provided that one had a you know a contract, and、uh, so I, I arrived in Tokyo in Haneda, and after my two weeks of quarantine, I start、uh, working at the、uh, Sasakawa Peace Foundation. So my when I go to work, I go to Toranomon, to the Sasakawa Peace Foundation building. And well, you know, my my colleagues there were most welcoming, and、uh, I'm really happy with、um, with my choice of of、uh, moving to Japan, and with the and grateful for the opportunity of being here. And that path even took me here today. Recently, you were knighted by the president of Italy. Um, could you tell us uh what led you to uh knighthood and Did you, by chance, get a sword as well? No. <laughs> well, I, I, I wish I, I had. You know,、uh, actually, if you get a PhD in Finland, you receive a sword. No way. So, <laughs>、oh, I know where I'm going next. <laughs> <laughs> no, I got the insignia of the knighthood of the Order of the Star of Italy, are a diploma, a medal, and a, well, what is called the Rosetta, the lapel pin. So I am supposed to wear the medal、uh, if in attendance at ceremonies in which the President of the Republic of Italy takes part. Otherwise, I'll just wear the lapel pin, and、uh, the diploma is quite nice. So it's, I got it already framed.、Uh, the p- problem is in Japanese apartments you cannot, you know, <laughs> plant nails, so <laughs> <Yeah> . I have to wait. I, have I to bet that's、it. a really cool Zoom background. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, the、mm, knighthood of the Order of the Star of Italy.、Uh, the order was actually、uh, created in 2011. Before it was called the Order of the Italian Solidarity. It is conferred to Italian overseas or foreign nationals that have helped promoting friendly, cooperative ties between Italy and、uh, other countries. Or that have illustrated, honored Italy in their professional field. In my case, uh, uh, you know, with my scholarly activities,、uh, that that is a motivation of my、uh, of the conferral. The bureaucratic process is quite baroque. <laughs>、uh, yeah. <laughs> the well, let's say you don't apply for that. Of course, you, it, somebody must.、Uh, Uh, bring forth your case to the Minister of Foreign Affairs of Italy. Then、uh, the Minister of Foreign Affairs bring up your case to a committee chaired by the President of the Italian Republic, and that must include the、uh, head of the Protocol of the Republic of Italy. And、uh, the decision is made. And、uh, after that, you will be informed. One will be informed that he has been, she or she, has received the the knight of the Order of the Star of Italy. There are several degrees, ranks within the order. I'm just a knight.、Uh, well, you know, maybe with time I will be able to climb the ladder. But it's it's an immense.、Uh, just joking here, but it's, it's an immense honor. And、uh, on May seventeenth. Coincidentally, my birthday this year,、uh, there was a, a, a ceremony at the Embassy of Italy here in Tokyo, 
officiated by the Chargé d'Affaires ad interim, because the, the embassy is in uh, between ambassadors, uh, the, cer- the ceremony was characterized by simple solemnity because you know, of an car- ongoing state of emergency. I could invite one person, and since I don't have a spouse, I thought that a way to show my gratitude to the Sasakawa Peace Foundation was to invite the president of the foundation, Dr. Atsushi Tsunami, that uh, was so kind to accept. So he came to represent the foundation at the ceremony. And uh, well, uh, the future is open. Wow, that's an amazing honor. And, uh, you know, not just uh, a doctor, but also an ambassador and a knight. I think uh, (laughs) Tokyo Wave is going places. (laughs) (laughs) You are the first uh, ambassador and knight, I believe, to be on our podcast. Thank you so much. (laughs) Again, a pleasure is mine. So your academic career has taken you around the world and to places in the Indo-Pacific that most of us here living in Japan are totally unfamiliar with. What has it been like living and lecturing in Australia, Japan, Taiwan, Italy, Fiji, Nauru, and Poland? Yep. And well, you know, and I, probably I, some more places that I wasn't able to find, but <laughs> I have to say that the most polite, respectful class I've ever had was in Fiji. The population of Fiji is, uh, well, divided into two groups. The Melanesian Fijians, they call themselves Itaoke, and then the Indo Fijians, they are about 37% of the population. Uh, they are the descendants of the indentured laborers that the British Empire brought to Fiji to work on in, in the sugarcane plantations in the late uh, 19th and early 20th century. Well, in the case of the Itaoke, they have a very ritual, liturgical, ceremonial culture, and the deep spirituality. So my Itaoke students, there were also some international students, by the way, from the Pacific and from other parts of the world, but my Itaoke students uh, wouldn't ask a question unless there's the senior Itaoke student had asked one before. So I had to instruct or to kindly ask my it's okay senior student to to ask a question and that you know start the conversation open the conversation in the classroom and sometimes i also had to take a break because my uh it's okay students uh most of uh, i would say almost the totality of it okay uh, in fiji are they belong to christian denominations want to take some time to pray at the same time at the university of fiji which is owned by um, an Hindu association, I had the opportunity to savor some vegetarian Indo-Fijian food. And uh, so I was really blessed with uh, with uh, both cultures that exist in, in Fiji. Fiji is a, itself is a diverse country. So, you know, there's also, a, for instance, a group of islands called Rotuma, where there is there is a a, a specific, uh, an old culture, uh, bestride in uh, Melanesia and Polynesia. Uh, so th- really the, the Pacific Island region is a microcosm, micro, well, not, not so much micro, you know, it's, it, it spans a huge oceanic expanse and uh, it includes three different ethnogeographic uh, regions and groups. And also within some countries, there are different languages cultures, tradition, just think about Papua New Guinea. In Papua New Guinea, there are so many different languages uh, that uh, it's, it's a paradise for ethnologists and anthropologists. Then, you know, I, I'm, I have the honor to of being an ambassador to a, a Micronesian country like Nauru. Nauru has its own language belong, that belongs to the Milan, uh, Micronesian and Austronesian families. And uh, quite an interesting history sometimes tragic, uh, you know, in 1888, it became part of, of a German colonies in the, in the Pacific. And then uh, during World War One, it was conquered by, uh, by the, the, the British Empire. 
and then uh, soon after, during World War II, the Japanese came. Part of the population was uh, displaced and forced to serve as laborers. And so also many uh, Nauruans died in, that, in those years. And then went back to Australia on a United Nations mandate. And in uh, 1968, eventually, it became independent again as Republic of Nauru. And it is uh, the world's smallest republic and democracy. And uh, well, you know that Nauru in, in the 1980s, 1990s, was one of the countries in the world with the highest per capita GDP, thanks to the export of phosphate, that had a heavy impact on the uh, territory of Nauru. So today the, the coastal ring is green and lush and fertile, but the top side, center of the island, is still scarred by intensive phosphate mining. And uh, sometimes Nauru is uh, mentioned in international media because for a few years it has been the one of, is part of Australia's so-called Pacific Solution. So uh, asylum seekers or refugees that were willing to go to Australia, were heading to Australia, uh, um, were diverted and uh, hosted in, in, in a camp in Nauru. Uh, I have to say that those people were free to move around the islands. It's small, it's a very small island, but you know, they weren't, I want to emphasize that generally speaking, they weren't kept as captives. They could even start uh, businesses in Nauru and some of them before being relocated to well, to Australia or to the US or other countries, even start some ethnic, uh, for instance, Central Asian or Middle Eastern ethnic restaurants. Wow, you know, this is just really incredible because neither Parker or myself have visited the Pacific Islands and um, our, our you know knowledge is quite limited. But, you know, it's becoming a hot issue for geopolitics in the Indo-Pacific now. Um, in 2017, you published your PhD dissertation titled Ocean Dragon, China and the Pacific Islands Region, Implications, New Equilibria and Synergies. Could you tell us more about your research and findings? All right. Well, you know, I... Since I was based in, in Taiwan, and uh, there are still some Pacific Island countries that recognize the Republic of China in Taiwan, over the past five years, some of them switched allegiance to the People's Republic of China, but Nauru is firmly in the Taiwanese camp. The China-Taiwan divide is one of the geopolitical divides that exist in the Pacific Islands region. I believe that geopolitically, the region has acquired centrality because it's one of the chessboards on which the game of influence between China and the West is played. China was able to spectacularly, by China I mean the People's Republic of China, was able to spectacularly rise and gain prominence in the Pacific Islands region by the means of uh, aid largesse and diplomatic proactivity. The Chinese are providing aid, especially uh, loans and infrastructures all over the world, so including the Pacific. And uh, there are now some Pacific Island countries that in terms of influence can be seen, and mine is a simplification, of course, as a condominium of influence between China and the West. When I mention the West, in the case of Melanesia, it is Australia. Uh, in the case of Micronesia, we're talking Australia and the US then we should keep in mind that in the Pacific, there are also some territories that are the remnants of uh, the European 
colonial empires. France, for instance, is in control of uh, New Caledonia, Wallace and Futuna, French Polynesia. Then uh, Britain still holds on Pitcairn, which is the, the island where the where the you know the the mutinies of the bounty and their Tahitian wives found a safe haven when they were pursued by the Royal Navy. So it's still British territory. Then Britain as Britain as the Commonwealth there, you know, there are many, several Pacific Island countries are members of the Commonwealth of Nations, including Fiji, for instance. So this is why Fijian uh, members of the Fijian military force, forces can, the Republic of Fiji military, can serve in, in, in the military of the United Kingdom. But there are also other cases, you know, uh, three uh, Micronesian states, uh, Marshall Islands, Federal States of Micronesia, Palau, have a so-called compact of free association with the United States of America. It means that the United States of America, in exchange for aid, support, and other forms of uh, cooperation, all have, are in charge of the defense policies of those countries. Going back to the Taiwan-China divide, two of, of, of the compact uh, states, Palau, and uh, Marshall Islands recognize Taiwan, the Federal States of Micronesia recognize China. And, uh, well, you know, recently the president of Palau publicly and vocally complained about what he called Chinese bullying because China is using both the stick and the carrot to persuade Taiwan's remaining diplomatic allies to... Uh, well, uh, switch to China, even using a, a narrative of ineluctability. Again, it is a very complex region. It is uh, now hot ground of China West competition. And uh, I believe that what the, the so called quad mechanism was established also to somehow, well, if you ask the, you know, the, the quad countries, they will tell you, no, it's to uh, maintain a rule-based order in the Indo-Pacific. We We've heard that one. We, yeah. acknowledge, <laughs> we acknowledge that because, uh, especially the order, because we are neutral, impartial, and apolitical. Uh, but, you know, some scholars surmise that it is was the kind of architecture arrangement was also created to contain China, the rise of China. I personally tend to agree, speaking as a scholar, not as a diplomat. In my case, I'm, I'm, I'm a credit to a country that uh, has strong ties with, with Taiwan. So I saw firsthand the kind of uh, aid that Taiwan is uh, providing to, to Nauru. Uh, sometimes you... Uh, I, I, I have... This is personal reconnection, of course. Uh, there were some lampposts with a well, a, a plaque reading "Love from Taiwan." I went to the to, when I went to visit the hospital in Nauru. There was a big photo of uh, Taiwan's president Tsai Ing-wen, uh, and the people are quite grateful and well disposed to Taiwan. Also, there are Nauruan students in Taiwan who benefits from the scholarships that the, the Taiwanese governments provide them. Maybe not many people know that there are some Pacific, some students from the Pacific Islands in La Habana, in Cuba. Uh, they attend the uh, Latin American School of Medicine, the ILAM, Escuela Latinoamericana de Medicina. And Cuba has some medical missions in, in, uh, in the Pacific. So they have this kind of uh, relationship based on the medical support that Cuba provides them. Uh, I remember when I visited Nauru's hospital, uh, I also had the pleasure of meeting Nauruan doctor, a lady, sorry, a Cuban doctor, a lady, who had been there for five years. 
So I, we start speaking in English, and then I, I noticed their accent was somehow different from that of Nauru. I said, sorry, if you don't mind me asking, where are you from? And I said, ah, from Cuba. And then we immediately start speaking Spanish. It was quite uh, uh, nice. Wow. Cuba is also in the South Pacific. That's, that's another thing that I had no idea about. Yeah, no, for sure. <laughs> Well, you talk about the rise of China, and obviously China is keenly interested in building relationships with Pacific Island nations, and as you very astutely mentioned, has been proactively engaging in so-called checkbook diplomacy with several small island nations who are, of course, in need of aid and infrastructure. Of course, as we are here in Tokyo, uh, I'd like to ask you, do you think this is a good thing or a bad thing for Japan? Uh, and also, you sort of touched on it earlier, but what should we know about China's rising presence in the South Pacific? Very well, it's, a, it's an important, I would call it an important question. Well, let's start with the fact that China, yes, in the past, and mainly because of the diplomatic rivalry with Taiwan, both China and Taiwan engage in so in so-called checkbook diplomacy or dollar diplomacy. What China is doing now is something different. China provides what I call infrastructural aid to uh, several Pacific Island countries, of course, only to the Pacific Island countries that recognize the People's Republic of China and also is a provider of loans. What characterizes China's aid provision and delivery to the Pacific Islands is that in order to build those infrastructures, normally China imports its own workforce. For instance, if they have to build an hospital, let's call it Chinese hospital, will be normally built by Chinese workforce, then some of that workforce tend to stay to stay uh, after the completion of the of their uh, of their contract, and and uh, they may become you know they start becoming economic competitors uh, to the locals. Then uh, let's say some Chinese interests and Chinese nationals are able to buy land to acquire land in uh, some Pacific Island countries, and land is an extremely sensitive, and land ownership, it's an extremely sensitive issue in uh, the Pacific Islands, leading to, even to anti-Chinese riots, as it happened in 2006 in uh, Honiara, for instance, as it keeps happening in Papua New Guinea. And, uh, well, China is also after some of the resources of the region. Uh, well, we should keep in mind that Pacific Island states are small when we look at their land territory, but they, they are also big ocean states if we consider the exclusive economic zones. In those exclusive economic zones in the high seas, there are substantial tuna fisheries. And uh, there's a competition for uh, Pacific tuna involving several countries, not just China. Actually, with climate change, something that as a, as a uh, researcher at the Ocean Police Research Institute, I would like to, to convey to your, to your public, you know, with climate change and with the uh, rising of the ocean temperature, those tuna shoals that currently swim or migrate uh, within the exclusive economic zones of the Pacific Island states will move to the high seas. So those Pacific Island states will lose substantial, important, crucial revenues in the future. I wonder, so if it's tuna that we're talking about, is Japan also a player in this? Japan is- Because we like tuna. Yeah, well, me too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I like my sashimi. But you know, uh, Japan is a player, but Japan is a is a, a established presence in the region, especially in some parts of the, the uh, Pacific, especially in Micronesia, where historically it also controlled territories. 
And uh, Japan is a uh, place fair. It hasn't always been the case, but I, you know, again, you are simp- generalizing, you're simplifying uh, the message. Japan is a generally perceived as a good guy in the region. It's also an important provider of aid, high quality aid to some Pacific Island countries. You know, um, on several occasions, Pacific Islanders complain about the quality and the standards and the modes of uh, Chinese aid provision. When it comes to Japan, Chinese aid can be described, uh, sorry, Japanese aid can be described as high quality, high standard. And uh, Japan is particularly close to some Pacific Island countries like Palau, for instance. It, it is also enjoys a very healthy, very friendly relationship with Nauru. Uh, then, but China is not in other powers and other, in our distant water fishing nations, Taiwan, South Korea, Spain, uh, name them. China is not only interested in, in fisheries, but also in other commodities that the region has. Forestry, timber, like you know, it is the case in Papua New Guinea or the Solomon Islands. Precious metals and minerals. Uh, for instance, in, in um, Papua New Guinea, the, one of the biggest lithium mines in the southern hemisphere is uh, operated by China, by Chinese interests. Uh, and then, you know, if we look two decades from now, there will also be a, a, a so-called mineral rush to the seabed minerals. Only a few countries are equipped to start mining the ocean bed, the, the, the seabed, for, for instance, manganese nodules in the uh, clarion Clipperton area, which is not far from the Pacific Islands, or the uh, uh, cobalt-rich crusts sounds a little bit, uh, you know, outlandish right now, but in order to make the switch to the green tech paradigm, we'll need those mineral resources very sooner than we, as, we, the, we the many people think. We cannot just rely on on, on uh, cobalt or coltan uh, mined by ch- child labor in in the. People's Republic of uh, Democratic Republic of Congo, for instance, but you know, uh, for instance, the, the seabed of the Cook Islands is rich in cobalt. Somebody is going to to mine that. China or somebody else. You know, you mentioned um, uh, that China's you know engaged in these loan based uh, industrial investment projects, um, and we've heard about a lot of these in uh, Africa as well. Would you say that the Pacific Islands? are as welcoming as the African countries are, or is the Pacific more resistant to a lot of this kind of Chinese investment? The Pacific Islands, and again, we are generalizing here, are not averse to China's presence in the region and China's aid provision. Actually, some of them have welcomed with open arms China because, first of all, they need all the all the help they can get. Uh, so China was also a, an additional, first of all, an additional aid provider, and also fresh foreign policy option and opportunity for those island states. Uh, they could even play one aid provider. Let's say the, the traditional, the established. Western partners against China and vice versa. So using a very picturesque analogy, we could say that several Pacific Island states are surfing the uh, US, uh, the, the China West rivalry in order to uh, benefit in terms of aid, geopolitical attention, geopolitical relevance, and also, the Pacific Island countries have learned to work as a group in order to have a louder voice and a bigger say 
in international affairs, especially when it comes to climate change. Uh, we should keep in mind that the, um, in 2018, at the Pacific Island Forum Summit in Nauru, the Pacific leaders issued the Boy Declaration that stating that climate change is the biggest security threat, an existential security threat to the region. So if China and other external powers intends to really engage with the Pacific Island countries and the region as a whole, uh, they should pay attention to the regional priorities, what the Pacific Islanders see as regional priorities. Right now is climate change, the, the blue economy, and you know, um, there's also the COVID-19 contingency. When it comes to that, the West has been quite uh, ready to respond, especially as, for instance, Australia, and, and offer uh, support, relief, and also vaccine. Nauru is the most vaccinated country in the world right now. Wow. wow. That's something you don't hear everywhere. No, for sure. <laughs> and so it's, uh, do you know what percent they're at? I, well, you know, uh, all the adult population has been vaccinated. Nauru is a population of about 10,000 people. So we should also contextualize that those figures. But nonetheless, it is of significance that they were very proactive in vaccinating the population. And, uh, well, uh, I hope that it will be the case also for other Pacific Island countries very soon. No, I think there's a lot of things that the South Pacific region has to be careful about in the coming decades as we have climate change and we have what is going to be, as you mentioned, the rise of mining the ocean beds and what are going to be the environmental implications of that. And so I think moving forward, we have to look more carefully at what's going on in the South Pacific, what's happening to the economy and also to the ecology of the region, as it's going to have larger implications for us as well in the future. Absolutely. Uh, you know, they, they are the Pacific Islanders are the custodians of the ocean. And uh, while the ocean is crucial for humanity's future, under many respects, you know, the region is the, is stands at the intersection of several futures. Our environmental future, our technology future, because, you know, if, if I, I'm right now holding my iPhone, inside this little thing, there are four, at least four different minerals, and most of them rare, and most of them can be found in the in the Pacific seabed floor. And uh, as I said before, the region now is geopolitically hot. It used to be a backwater during uh, the Cold War and uh, until the, the, the turn of the millennium, it's not the case anymore. Now it is a very important regional subset of the Indo-Pacific or the Indo-Pacific mega region. And also some Pacific Island countries have become more diplomatically proactive. Uh, and so they, if we think about Fiji, Fiji is an omnidirectional diplomacy. Uh, so friends to everybody, enemy to none. And they are being proactively engage, engaging and creating partnership with uh, you know, the, um, the outer world. So we can say that now many Pacific Island countries are looking north and the North is not just China, of course, not just Beijing. It's also Tokyo, it's Seoul, it's Moscow, it's New Delhi, it's Canada. Well, basically everything is north of the South Pacific. Well, yeah, <laughs> more or less, you're right. But, you know, before they were looking south, Canberra and Wellington, and in some cases, west, uh, now they are they are also looking north. So yeah, they they are discovering this that new uh, cardinal point. <laughs> Some of the established regional partners still have to come to terms with this, this new reality, 
Uh, I will say that Japan is uh, actually playing its game quite well. Uh, there's room for improvement. And the way to go is to uh, establish, in my opinion, establishing climate security alliances and partnership and uh, developing a long term vision for working with the Pacific Islands region. Uh, very soon there will be the, uh, the Palm 9 Summit uh, will be held this year uh, online between Japan and uh, all the Pacific Island countries. It is a triennial summit that is uh, held normally in Japan. This year, we, because of the COVID-19 pandemics, uh, we'll, be, uh, we'll use information technology to connect. And the uh, Sasakawa Peace Foundation is uh, part of the, of the equation, is, is involved in, in the, both in the preparation and the, in the conduct of the, of the Palm 9, because it's 9, because the ninth edition of the summit in the Palm 9. So I uh, also give a presentation in one related uh, event of uh, Palm 9. Guess what? It was going to be on climate security in the Pacific Islands. Wow. So many things to look to the future about. Well, to end our talk today on a lighter note, uh, since you're so well-traveled in the South Pacific region, I wonder if you could give us Three suggestions on destinations that people should have on their radar for travel once, of course, the pandemic is over. Okay. Well, you're, you're uh, putting me in a difficult spot here because, you know, remember, a neutral, impartial, and apolitical. But, okay, first choice, Nauru. I believe it will be particularly appealing to adventurous tourists and people who are inter interested in understanding the, the history of the Pacific and Micronesia. And besides, I can guarantee that passengers fly very comfortably on Nauru Airlines uh, airliners. Then my second choice would be Fiji. I have a, a sentimental attachment to the country and I miss the smiles of the Fijian people. I miss saying Bula or Yandra in the morning. Fiji is, has so much to offer. You know, it's a high elevation island, so you will find a wonderful resource, but also um, leafy uh, mountains, cultural wonders, fantastic food. Besides, if you, if you are in Suva, the capital city of, of Fiji, you can enjoy both. Melanesian and Indo-Fijian food. So I, I, I still remember some fantastic curry I had there. The, the third option, I would say either Palau or Vanuatu. But really, you know, once one starts visiting the Pacific Islands, they become like a magnet. They, they draw you back. And, uh, 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 and, and there are so many micro experiences to have. Uh, you can have some wonderful coffee from, you can brew some wonderful coffee from the island of Tanna in Vanuatu, where maybe you heard that there is, there, there are some villages where, well, Prince Philip of Edinburgh, who as we know passed away recently, was and is venerated as a deity, as a god. And they fly the Union Jack, they have many photos of Prince Philip there. Uh, then you, you know, you can, do a scuba diving in, in, in the Cook Islands uh, or, uh, you know, in, in Papua New Guinea. Uh, I would say, don't be afraid to pick a destination. You will not be disappointed in any case. And uh, then keep exploring. Be prepared to fly or if you're so lucky to have a sailboat to sail. But, you know, it's... Uh, it's worth visiting the heart of the Pacific. Wow, that's uh, inspiring. I think uh, all of a sudden the South Pacific, which is really somewhere that I, I don't think I've ever really thought about checking it out. It sounds really intriguing and it's a totally unknown region. Of course, thanks to this uh, episode today, I think we know a lot more about the region and I think this is a good opportunity for us to do some more homework as well. Thank you.
For sure. I'm, I'm looking forward to uh, travel again now. <laughs> Yeah, since uh, out of institutional interest, if I may, you know, um, in uh, even in the Pacific, the Order of Malta has some uh, humanitarian initiatives. Uh, we have an official website, uh, www.orderofmalta.int. Uh, please visit it, and well, if you want to know more about the order, its history, its, its humanitarian effort. Thank you. Thank you so much for your time today. Yes, thank you so much. Hey, listeners, that's right. You, you listener right there. Who do you think should be our next guest on Tokyo Wave? Let us know. Drop us a line at wave at tokyowave.jp. We hope you enjoyed Tokyo Wave. If you haven't already, you can subscribe to our podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, SoundCloud, and YouTube. Join us again next week on Tokyo Wave. <laughs>